Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Driven by Cause. This, uh, this episode is brought to you by Ariva and Microsoft, the thought leaders behind the industry's only completely integrated and fully automated cloud-based software for digital fundraising, donor relationship management, healthcare hospitality, and auction software. I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Jay Fisk. Jay, how are you today? It is great to be here, David, and I am excited to meet today's guest. Well, you're right about that, Jay. We have an awesome guest joining us today. He's the founder of LAPA Fundraising, which provides fundraising services, models, tools, and expertise to facilitate the success of nonprofit organizations around the world. He is also the author of the nonprofit fundraising solution, Powerful Revenue Strategies, to take you to the next level and is, and is a professor at the New York University's Heyman Center for Philanthropy and Fundraising. And he has coached dozens of nonprofit executive directors with the Rutgers Business School's Institute for Ethical Leadership. Let's all welcome Lawrence Pagoni. Thank you for being here with us, Lawrence. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. I'm glad to meet you, Jay and David, and uh, be part of this series. Well, we're really happy to have you here today. And I'd like to start off by asking if you can share with us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in this industry. Uh, well, I'll go way back. At age 13, my Teamster Union dad dropped me off uh, to volunteer overnight at uh, St. Francis Inn Soup Kitchen in North Philadelphia. And I had a religious experience that night uh, being there with the homeless sleeping over like St. Francis himself, my eyes were open to the plight of the homeless living there, for without that shelter, they, they would be on the street. And uh, my heart was broken. I'd never seen that level of uh, poverty before. And, and I wanted to be part of the solution going forward. That same year, I was the highest door-to-door -door fundraiser in my Boy Scout troop. And the scout leader told me that I had a talent for soliciting. So those two experiences at age 13 were key to forging my career and my life ever since. You traveled the country coaching organizations and their leaders uh, on advanced fundraising. And uh, can you share with the audience what is meant by the term advanced fundraising? Yes. Uh, and, and also some of the more effective strategy you, you use. It's a good question. Um, most fundraising is routine, siloed, and prosaic. Um, it lacks depth, and it's not sufficiently donor or community-centered. When you have a fundraising program that's donor-centered or community-need-centered, you just do better because the donors see themselves as the central feature in making that mission effective, and they see the point of why their gift is so necessary when you talk about the community, the neighborhood, the, the uh, impact. When a nonprofit client chooses a consultancy like LAPA Fundraising, and we focus on helping them build advanced fundraising, they're saying that they want to break out of that mediocrity and excel. Like any change process, it's, it's an ambitious path, but necessary if the nonprofit wants to fulfill its mission. Because without the revenue, the mission and vision they have is really dead on, dead on arrival. Specifically, advanced fundraising is rooted in, in a development plan that's chock full of nuanced tactics. The strategy of fundraising really comes from the organizational mission of what it's trying to accomplish. But most of fundraising is tactical and the devil is in the details. Tactics that embrace behavioral science so that the fundraising can respond to donors better or when they embrace advanced prospect research to find new donors and to avoid asking the current donors, to, to under ask the current donors. Also in the digital age, things move so rapidly and donor communication needs to be digitized and yet personal, which is not easy to achieve. Outsourcing as an option in the fundraising department, not just for core staffing, 
but also for expansion of ideas that haven't been tried before. C- consultants and outsourcing of fundraising is, you know, is, is excellent for that to make sure that it's established properly and launched properly. And then you train a staff to whatever that particular program is. The advancement of uh, having an advanced fundraising program, most nonprofits don't really you know, do that. They just live within few grants or government contract or the few group of donors that they have. Now, you, now you just clearly talked about a very complex set of tools that need to be implemented. And it's often lost upon nonprofit leaders, the concept of actually paying uh, for fundraising, having a budget set aside, you know, for uh, for building an, an infrastructure, can you elaborate a little bit on the strategy and why it's important for nonprofits to think of it in terms of spending some money to make money or setting aside a budget line to uh, to handle it? In business, you know, if you don't have equity or startup funds, you you don't advance. How did nonprofits even come to question the idea of investing in revenue development? Well. If you go way back, you know, some of the first nonprofits in the country were founded by the, the wives of Protestant business people who literally will, were doing good work in the community so that they could atone for the capitalist sins of their husbands. The ladies who lunch, they uh, would find the money and therefore many boards who developed from that model uh, were responsible for raising the revenue. So that's why they didn't have a professional staff. And also, the fundraising profession as a whole is not really founded until the late 1940s, 1950s. We're a very young profession, and it took us 50 years to develop a, a code of ethics that was worth having. It's always good to have perspective about how we got here. But I, I want to say, Jay, that I empathize with the difficulty of dedicating a significant budget for fundraising capacity, at least to a point. The fact is that without revenue, the nonprofit sets its own glass ceiling on its ability to deliver on its mission. And that's not good. I mean, for example, an international nonprofit recently called me who just received a $5 million gift from the Bill Gates Foundation, and and they were deserving of it. It, it, they They do terrific work. But the nonprofit CEO could not get his head around that now was a good time to invest in developing their fundraising program because he was referencing how they got there. Look, you know, focusing on mission got us this $5 million. And I said to him, but it's not going to get you the next one. And I, I, would you like me to tell you all the nonprofits that got $5 million from wealthy philanthropists? And then five years later, they were right back to where they were. There's just this naivete that we have to challenge about business development. We're essentially there to deliver exceptional advanced fundraising service services to nonprofit clients who wish to invest in, uh, in advancing that, that fundraising capacity. Signif- specifically, that means finding new donors, preparing and launching for a major campaign, or investing or managing their annual fund for them for better performance and a higher return on investment. And it turns out that 74% of nonprofits in the United States live uh, with an annual budget of 250,000 or below. And so they don't invest in fundraising capacity. And that's their choice for various reasons. I'm not saying all nonprofits should do that. I'm Mm -hmm. saying that if you are very serious about solving the social dilemma behind your mission and vision, building up your fundraising capacity is is really crucial. And uh, I believe that LAPA's mission is needed now more than ever because we're in a digital age where better online engagement is necessary because of the advances in behavioral sciences. We know a lot about why donors stop giving, why they give at higher levels, why they give more to one nonprofit than another. So these things need to be taken advantage of because we know more than we ever have. So those two reasons alone keep LAPA's mission front of mind and prescient. You're known for finding donors where they don't exist. What can you share with our audience about your best practices for finding new donors? You uh, are singing my tune. Um, (laughs) Finding new donors where none exists is the subject of a new book that I'm writing. It's called 10 
steps towards finding new donors. The most important thing to know right off the bat is that you find new donors by not losing your current ones. The average donor retention rate is only, it's hoovering right now at 40 to 45% across the nonprofit sector. That means that if 100 donors gave to your nonprofit this year, then only about 40 of them will give again next year. That happens because the nonprofit hasn't sufficiently stewarded their donor. The drop-off rate, it should be under 10%. And here we are at losing 40 to 45% of donors. So that's the first step to retain new donors is to not lose the current ones. And then secondly, finding new donors means that you're looking for donors who share your organizational values. It's not just randomly 100 you know, new people. It's those 100 people have to get what you're doing. And ideally, they should be like really jazzed about it. For example, Partners in Health is an international, a terrific international organization founded by Dr. Paul Farmer. They reached out to me and asked me, was I familiar with Partners in Health? And I had just ironically read Tracy Kidd's book about Paul Farmer. I said that I was familiar with it and very impressed, and I was glad that they approached me. So they had clearly done their work that I was a value-aligned donor, and uh, I've been a major donor to them for uh, the past decade or more. So value alignment of finding the person who's as excited about your mission as you are, is, is the second thing towards finding new donors. And that's, we use the tools of prospect research to figure out who that is. We're about to do this work for a, a Jewish organization that focuses on substance recovery and tr treatment here in mm -hmm. the New York City area. And we are sharing our methodology about how to find new prospective donors with the organization to see if, if we have it right. But I think that they'll be blown away by how we approach it technologically and mm -hmm. psychologically. A humane society in Westchester, New York, had a lot of volunteers and they weren't uh, cultivating and soliciting their volunteers. I'm talking, they had 12 to 1500 volunteers. That's a lot mm -hmm. for a small yeah. nonprofit. So we, we wealth screened their entire volunteer list and found over 350 major donors with capacity to give amongst their volunteers who were not being solicited. Make a long story short, uh, that was part of a, um, a multi-million dollar capital uh, uh, campaign to renovate their facility. And uh, within 18 months, we, we succeeded in raising somewhere around four and a half million, if my memory is correct, right. which was more money than they had ever raised before, but going to new donors who were value aligned and as engaged uh, with their mission as the staff and the board was, that was the key to the success of raising money that fast. You know, I know we don't have a lot of time, but you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of our key performance indicators for any nonprofit is donor retention and and getting that. And when you mention that statistic, it should be concerning to a lot because uh, it is very difficult to go from a new donor and then retain them. What's some of the advice you know you could offer on donor retention specifically and making sure your current donors feel connected to your mission and want to continue giving? Yeah. So there's a couple little things that are very important. And the goal here is to avoid the 40 to 45% drop off and to get it below 10%, right? So when you ask for the gift and you thank them for the gift, you have to immediately try to enroll the donor in your monthly giving society. If you can enroll them in your monthly giving society, the chances of retaining them skyrocket. Now, not everybody is a candidate for monthly giving, or, you know, we call them the sustainers club or, what, you know, whatever poetic word you're using, inviting them to some form of engagement as soon as they make that first gift. For example, asking them to volunteer with your organization in whatever way that that may look like for you, or if they have enough capacity, 
uh, ask for a call to get to know them more. If the call goes well, possibly invite them to your leadership council. If you don't have one, you can read at the LAPA fundraising blog all about how to create a leadership council. I have a white paper on that subject, lapafundraising.com. These strategies to engage a donor as soon as they make the first gift, most nonprofits just, well, I was going to say they just say thank you. I wish that were the case. Most nonprofits don't say thank you till weeks, maybe months later. It's crazy. We know that if a donor is thanked lavishly very fast, that, re, that, that they're, they're more likely to stay engaged with that nonprofit. Um, there's many uh, donors that I've interviewed who have lapsed. They say at the beginning of the call, Lawrence, um, what was the name of that nonprofit again? <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you talk about saying thank you. I'm I'm of the belief that you can never say thank you too early or too often, right? Exactly. Say it immediately. It's sort of like sales 101, right? Sales 101, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, tell them what you told them. So thank you is the same way. Thank them immediately. Thank them uh, continuously. Thank them before the next ask. Thank them after the next ask and so on. You know, you, you talked um, eloquently about how to get donors and also how to retain donors. Let's talk about the 45% that have lapsed. How do we get those 45% back? Sadly, Jay, the fact is that I, I, ha I have a webinar on lapsed donors, um, which if you go to the webinar page at lapafundraising.com, you can you can see it there. It's it's titled How to Re-Engage and Bring Back Lapsed Donors. But lapsed donors can be revitalized, but not all of them. It's just statistically not possible. But they're more likely to donate again than someone who doesn't know your organization, if in fact they do know your organization. And the key is to, as I mentioned, to ask for engagement when they make that first gift and preferably to seek a monthly gift. Researching when a donor comes in through prospect research, their capacity to give, we try to have a standard to do that research within 48 hours of them making their first gift because knowing their potential to give will help you segment them appropriately for deep engagement. Um, there's oftentimes I make a hundred dollar donation to a nonprofit to see what they're gonna do with it. And we know that most donors who make a first time gift generally have about 10 times the capacity to give beyond uh, that initial gift. So my capacity would probably be about a thousand dollars as a significant annual gift to most nonprofits. Mm. And, um, but if they don't do their research on my other giving, they won't know that. So, so incorporating prospect research, integrating that to first time donors will start to help you understand who to focus on. For those that don't have a large capacity, it's not that we ignore them, no, no, no. We just put them in our digital engagement funnel as opposed to the personal engagement funnel because we can't keep up with that many donors if if you have a lot some nonprofits don't have that many so it's not not a big a deal to handle them personally these are very interesting times to say the least and we are now in a new economic climate and while we're still trying to recover from the effects of covid and i think we're doing a decent job but nonprofit organizations are facing a new landscape in terms of fundraising again. What advice could you give to the nonprofits that are listening today, trying to survive during these tough financial times? Well, uh, I know the three of us remember the 1960s song, uh, the times they are a changing. <laughs> the, truth, the, truth, the truth is every time that, that people have lived through, they thought that it was the most radical changes. I mean, can you imagine, you know, being alive when Gutenberg was around and then, you know, seeing prints, printed books, you know, it was, it must have been astounding. So uh, as we live, no matter what the period of time is, we witness what feels like enormous change, no matter the time period. That being said, let me suggest some very practical things for these times. First of all, as you head towards, as nonprofits head towards year-end fundraising, having an anti, 
inflation message is important. That message would essentially describe the value that the donor can affect by giving to, to that nonprofit. In other words, there might be inflated value, but the value proposition here is still very high in terms of human life impact. And here is the data and the numbers about that. So that would be an anti-inflation message. Um, I think that that's important as we face uh, this particular year end giving. And then of course, looking in the mirror at your organization uh, in terms of your commitment to diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, DEI, um, is a very important thing to be, to, you, hopefully you've been doing that for the past two years, but um, uh, making some decisions and changes to be more uh, diverse, uh, equitable, and inclusive. Equitable changes in a nonprofit right now means that some of our lower paid workers need uh, significant wage increases. Uh, we can't be going around the world talking about income inequality and not paying our staffs uh, appropriately. Yeah. Um, and so nonprofits have to raise their own compensation bars. Um, many nonprofits have good, well-paid executive teams, but their, you know, their lower paid staff uh, need, need, need raises and they need benefits. It's not okay to, to have a job and not have health care. Everything I just mentioned is a result of the pandemic making us more acutely aware of uh, health care inequities, uh, racial justice inequities, and income inequalities. Again, fundraising is concerned about these things because this is why you need a robust fundraising program so that you have the economic capacity to, to do right by your staff, to do right by the community, to do right by the client. You know, that was great. And in, in, in your book, The Nonprofit Fundraising Solution, Powerful revenue strategies take you to the next level. You discuss a wide variety of issues, but one of the points you mentioned is that the executive leadership and your board should fully support fundraising initiatives. What advice would you give uh, to get the board engaged in fundraising? Because I hear, I do hear a lot, yeah, I have a great board, but they're not active. Yeah. And they would always like to get them active. So from that, what would you share with the audience to get them more engaged in fundraising. I'm one of the few fundraisers in the country that doesn't necessarily look for all boards to be leaders in fundraising. Mm -hmm. I know statistically that only about somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of boards will actually be a leader in fundraising. And that's about it. That's about as high as it, it's ever been. Uh, there's there's this kind of myth that at some glorious moment in our past that there were all these fundraising leading boards. It never was and it never will be. However, that doesn't mean that the board shouldn't understand the fundraising program. It, it, it doesn't mean that the board should not have a development plan. It means that they should know that a significant budget is needed and time is needed to allow the fundraising team to build up a return on investment that it doesn't happen overnight, that it's called development for a reason. It's a developmental process. So boards need to be expert and leaders in making sure there's a plan there and that the right people are at the helm of the fundraising initiative, specifically the CEO, uh, is the is in my opinion always the chief fundraiser, mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of CEOs feel and look to me like program leaders, but not revenue leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think that that model has died a slow and long death. I do hope that generally there's about twenty percent of the board members who are comfortable talking about money and wanting to learn fundraising, but. You know, in the 1970s and 80s, David, we used to go in and train boards how to fundraise before a capital campaign. Mm -hmm. I mean, after 10 years of that, I thought, well, this is this is insanity, you know, because you can't make somebody 
a fundraiser who has no interest in it and whose personality is not suited accordingly. And that's not to say I've seen terrific fundraisers in every type of personality, whatever psychological diagnostic tool you're using to describe personalities. So I'm not stereotyping that all fundraisers need to be, you know, raging extroverts. Not That's not the case at all, but, but you have to want to, you have to be curious about how money works and about how donors and funders think. And if you are, then you're trainable. But if you're not, you're not trainable. So you've taught students, uh, Lawrence, you've taught students at the New York University Hyman Center for Philanthropy and Fundraising uh, and fundraising, and Coach Dozens of nonprofit executive directors, uh, Rutgers Business School uh, Institute for Ethical Leadership. A lot of experience. Uh, having all of this experience with working with younger individuals uh, in the philanthropic world, uh, is there anything you could share about the next generation of, of uh, nonprofit industry, uh, you know, up and comers, if you will, and uh, how that might change the, the landscape in the industry? Oh, yes. Thank you for asking. That's a very important question. We baby boomers are aging out of the nonprofit leadership fast. Uh, many of us started organizations post-Vietnam, and there's a huge impending leadership void in the sector that needs to be filled. Also, nonprofit boards tend to skew older, and they often quietly distrust youth and inexperience. The, the danger is that that cycle uh, will continue. However, in less than a decade, uh, millennials will make up 75% of the workforce. Stumbling stone of uh, judging youth and inexperience as not the right fit is, is going to die on the vine anyway. It would behoove the nonprofits who are listening today to upgrade any outmoded structures, employment structures uh, that they have in order to best facilitate their next generation leaders, many of whom are already in your organization, as well as to ensure a long life for your nonprofit by, by grooming that next generation. Millennials care deeply about climate change because they're going to live it. They care deeply about uh, overcharging and uh, awful lending practices around securing an education, student loans. So eliminating student debt is high on their priority list. And they understand big tech, so their gifts in that area can help the nonprofit sector tremendously. Millennials are deeply interested and involved in social movements for greater equality, whether it be race, income, or access to power. Yet most nonprofits, Jay, don't have a leadership succession plan. Executives move on to different opportunities or personal circumstances emerge unexpectedly at a, at a crucial point in fundraising. Organizations need a, a solid leadership succession plan in order to prevent potential crises resulting from life curveballs. I'm hopeful, but I think that the nonprofit governance has to be more adaptive to being proactive about leadership development. Well, you know, you, you brought up the millennials on the shift and 75 percent, uh, you know, clearly there's going to be a change in the landscape. So we're going to let you use your crystal ball here a little bit. You know, uh, what are some of the significant changes that you've seen in the nonprofit industry since you've been in it? And where do you think the future is? Where, what's it going to look like down the, down the road a little bit? Well, I think the future holds that nonprofits will take more stands, social justice stands. Nonprofits can and should be playing a critical role in leading on those issues, yet their leadership is often muted by fundraising concerns and risk adverse boards of directors at just the time that they are needed the, the most. So I would expect to see young, younger leaders filling the vacuum and speaking out on issues that their elders have been reluctant to be vocal about. We're already seeing uh, more attention paid to living wages for nonprofit workers in this past year, uh, especially entry level and junior roles, as I mentioned. And of course, there's more media scrutiny, as there should be, of nonprofit CEO compensation. That's a, a piece of the future that's already here. Those were my predictions two years ago. I went back and look, I write, you know, a 
uh, every uh, New Year's Eve, I write a blog about, you know, with my crystal ball out. One last thing I'd mention is that there was a significant change resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic where uh, uh, more established foundations found themselves to be more empathetic and more flexible in their giving general operating support to nonprofits. I specifically mentioned established foundations, the bigger ones. Lawrence, we don't want to wait till the end of the year and you write your blog. So I, I got a question for you in looking at the future ahead. Where do you hope to make the biggest impact? LAPA fundraising is always aspired to positively change the way nonprofit executives think about fundraising and the way their boards think, plan, and grow their fundraising programs. We embrace development as a challenge that inspires rather than something to avoid. And we leverage our expertise to empower organizations to achieve transformational results for their clients. My thinking on that is to sign up for my free weekly blog post at lapafundraising.com and or possibly attend one of the webinars and or to read one of my books. If you can't afford any of my books, I will email you a PDF copy. That's how committed I am to public education about advanced fundraising. If you can't afford it, just send me an email. You don't have to explain yourself. My email is Lawrence with a U at lapafundraising.com. And um, Lawrence is usually spelled with a W, L-A-W, but it's mine is L-A-U, so that they can use these ideas in their fundraising to make it more advanced, even if they can't engage a consultancy. Uh, but we're coming towards the end of the podcast, and we always like to ask our, our guests to tell us something on a personal level that might surprise our listeners. Uh, a, a little bit about about you. So tell us something personal that we might and our listeners might find interesting uh, about you and your personal life. Well, when I was a baby fundraiser, I had a lot of stress one year and I kept going to the doctor and he said, he asked me, I, I was having trouble. It looked like symptoms of asthma and it wasn't, it wasn't asthma. In that whole experience, I had to reduce my stress and I came to appreciate Tai Chi and yoga at that time, my knees were better than they are now, so I was running. Uh, these days, I bike. But integrating self-care, physical self-care, a few hours each day has, has made me a better fundraiser. Our work is can be stressful by physical exercise, uh, yoga, tai chi, or biking, uh, swimming. I like to swim. These things are often a surprise to people who don't know me. And I consider that essential to making me a great fundraiser. Yeah, that's great. Maybe we'll get to go biking one day together. I love biking too. But um, hey, we always like to finish off our show by asking, what is something that I didn't ask you or Jay didn't ask you that you wish either one of us had asked you? Well, I wish you'd ask me about what the most lucrative days of the year are for fundraising because they're coming up. What are the most lucrative days of the year? <laughs> that was quick, Jay. Thank you. <laughs> the last four days of the year, December 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st, are the most lucrative fundraising days of the year. In fact, my blog post that's coming out this Thursday or Friday is called The Last Four Days of the Year. If you show up with a couple of emails a day with different styles, and I talk about this in the blog post, you will raise a fair amount of money online. Uh, direct mail program, of course, should, should be going out in time for people to get uh, material on those last four days. We know so much about how money works in our sector now. I could even tell you the hours on, on each of those days that are the most lucrative, but I won't tell you here. You'll have to read my blog post about it. Uh, Lawrence, this was great. I can't thank you. We'll be right back after this. We are a team that has had an enduring influence on the nonprofit industry for more than three decades. We pride ourselves on developing and delivering technology with a purpose, software born of a genuine understanding and passion for cause. We are relentlessly dedicated to our client success. We are with our clients for good. We are Ariva, tech with purpose, driven by cause. 
Ariba is the trusted advisor and market leader of fundraising, donor relationship management, and auction software and services. Exceed further, our evolutionary all-in-one digital fundraising and donor relationship management software is helping nonprofits worldwide further their mission, transform fundraising, and cultivate relationships with donors and constituents. Our Maestro Auction virtual, live, and silent auction software, text to bid virtual and mobile bidding software, and text-to-fund, text-based donation software are helping nonprofits raise billions of dollars through thousands of virtual fundraising events, charity auctions, and galas. Visit Ariva.com and reach out today and see how Ariva can help your nonprofit organization go further. Welcome back, everyone. All right, we're going into our next segment, Ask the Maestro. Jay, what question do you have from our audience today? All right. Well, David, uh, we have some interesting questions today. And, uh, and the first one comes from Steve. And I thought it might be a good question for Lawrence to answer uh, since he's worked with so many young people before. So Steve would like to know, and Lawrence, this question's for you. What would the world look like if service was the common expectation and the common experience of every young person? Oh, my goodness. What a, good, what a beautiful question. I'm a big fan of Pete Buttigieg. And uh, Pete talks about national service all the time. Service doesn't have to be in the military. We have VISTA, we have the Peace Corps, we have the national service programs. Young people need these experiences. This is why I believe that we have such separation uh, between blue states and red states these days, or blue communities and red communities. During World War II, when we had the FDR's Corps of Engineers, the Corps of, of Volunteers who went out and revamped forests, People got to know people of different crosses of life and different complexions and different ways of thinking, uh, regional ways of thinking and, and non-regional ways of thinking. I think we need a national service requirement to be reinstated, and it needs to be done well, of course, but I think that that would help our democracy greatly. Yeah. So I, I think Steve's question is, uh, is brilliant. I agree with you on that one as well. You know, the country, the, our country gives so much to its citizens. It's not too much to ask the citizens to give a little bit back to the country. Totally, yeah. totally. Love that. And that was a great answer, Lawrence. Yeah. Our next question comes from Lisa. My organization is looking to hire a fundraising consultant. What kind of question should we be asking? And what are the most important things to look for when choosing who to hire? Oh, Lord, 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 Lord. <laughs> you, you think I'd know that right off the top of my head, but let me, uh, let me suggest a few things. So we have a certification in the nonprofit sector called the CFRE, the Certified Fundraising Executive. When you, uh, like, for example, everybody on LAPA's executive team is a certified fundraising executive. If somebody has that credential, they've been through rigorous fundraising uh, training, and there are standards behind the CFRE credential set by an international body. Looking for a certified fundraising executive uh, would be my uh, orientation. That doesn't mean that if people don't have a CFRE that they're not terrific fundraisers. They're more likely to have the theory and the experience if they have the CFRE credential. Then secondly, i I'd uh, ask for examples of, of past fundraising that they've done. And you're not looking for somebody who's, you know, worked for your mission or worked in your space necessarily. That may or may not apply. But you're looking for somebody who's dealt with the, the dilemma, the fundraising dilemma that you face. So, for example, uh, David, maybe the dilemma is, hey, we haven't had new donors here. So asking the consultant, you know, can you give me examples of how you've developed new donors for your current or past clients? So looking at your fundraising dilemma would be the second thing uh, I would suggest. Thirdly, uh, to see if you have the right budget for the problem you're trying to solve, having a fifteen dollars or $20,000 budget when you're trying to raise three or $4 million is not going to work. And a lot of nonprofits call consultants with a very limited budget. So finding out what budget is required, you could find that out from, let's say you have a foundation that gives to you, ask your foundation officer. They know a lot about our sector. 
You can ask another nonprofit CEO who has a successful fundraising program, what does this really cost to do? Mm -hmm. Um, You can also look online. There's a lot published about what successful fundraising costs. For example, the Better Business Bureau thinks that a three to one return is a good return. A bonus uh, bonus question I'm going to throw at you, and that is, how do you respond to a nonprofit that's reluctant to pay for professional help? Well, you know, the old adage, you can't make a, you could bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But you can point out the unintentional consequences of not investing in fundraising, that you're likely to remain where you are, the stagnation aspect. You can give them examples of your own return on investment. Like if you look at the LAPA website, you'll actually see report cards that, that are published each year about the return on investment that our current clients uh, affected. So understanding how return on investment works in fundraising and the the time span that's required, generally you need about 18 to 24 months before you start to see good returns. And expecting results faster than is reasonable is a problem with people who are new to fundraising. I run into it sometimes in my profession as an auctioneer. I'll find people that are going you know, to want to raise $100,000 or two hundred fifty dollars or maybe a million dollars on their auction. They're looking for a free auctioneer. I go, you know, you, you're, you're paying the caterer for the food. You're paying the band for the entertainment. You paid the post office for the stamps to mail out the invitations. You paid the decorator. You know, you paid everybody and you want to, the one person who's going to be able to control your revenue and, and you're, reluct, you're reluctant to pay, you think that's a volunteer job. So we sometimes have to, you know, let people know you get what you pay for, right? And it usually only takes one bad experience with a volunteer auctioneer for them to get religion. Jay, you you have to blame the pilgrims. And uh, Dan Pilata's book, which you should read about this, is called Uncharitable. It's about the history of how the sector, why it got that way, thinking like that. Well, listen, uh, you've given some great advice today. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, I'm sad to say we're at the end of our, at the end of our time. And, you know, we could probably, David and I know we're loving talking to you. We could probably talk to you for another hour or two, Uh, but it's time to say goodbye. And uh, we'd like to thank you so much. Thanks for answering the questions. Those of you that are watching would like to submit your own questions for us to answer on a future podcast, by all means, uh, send us, uh, let let us know your Ask the Maestro questions and we'll find a future guest uh, to, uh, to answer them or we may answer them ourselves between David and I. So, so thanks again, Lawrence. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jay. Lawrence, it was a pleasure having you with us today. It was such a treat. Thank you so much for all your insight and advice to our listeners. Peace. And while while you're at it, let's make sure you go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Do not miss out on any of Driven by Cause. I also want to give you a, a special thanks to the amazing sponsors, Arriva and Microsoft, for their support and allowing us to be here with you today. Thank you all for all your fantastic Listeners, we hope you'll join us next time on Driven by Cause. Make it a great day. 